So happy Tuesday. Well, I look I look different today, don't I? Nobody nobody gets that joke. <laughs> So these, this is an attendance register. Everybody assign. And these are copies of last lecture's notes. For anybody that missed them. Copies of last lecture's notes. If you missed them. So uh, I'm filling in for Adeline today, just for today. Yeah, she invited me to give this lecture because she knows how amazing and outstanding it is. So for anybody that missed it last week, we're talking about three things. Unit testing, integration testing in the context of a real world example. Right, so we're mixing all three of those things. And it's not very often that you're going to get to see like real world programs that are fully functional and do something. Right, so we gave, we gave an introduction to unit testing and integra integration testing, the theory, last time. And we started to talk about this example. Now what we're doing, what this program does is it converts an XML file, I'm sorry, an Excel file to XML format. That's what the program does. We're going to look at the program that does that today. Sound exciting? Any questions before we start? I like how everybody got on one side. I've never seen that before. You're the outlier. <clears throat> you're, the, you're the maverick. So this is what the spreadsheet looks like, right? It has different columns and different rows. The first row is the paper ID, the paper title, abstract, keywords, starting page, page range, author, first author, first name, first author, surname, and so on. So we're talking about a spreadsheet with a list of publications in it, or the metadata of all the publications, not the actual publications themselves, all the data about them. We want to take this spreadsheet in Excel format and convert it to XML format. That's the, that's the you can imagine that being a, a software engineering to project. That could, that could definitely be a project for this class. No pun intended. So let's look at the program that actually does that. <clears throat> so it's called CSV to XML. Right, we started to look at it last time. We want to, to continue this time. And we'll start with the main, the main method, right? So this is the main method of CSV to XML. It can also be viewed as, an, as a demonstration of integration testing. Does anybody remember what integration testing is? It's when in your class you have a main method, and then you test methods from your class. You call them. That, that's unit testing. Oh, yeah. That's a textbook definition of it. Is it Yen, Yenis or something? Yenis, yeah. Yenis. That's a very good answer for unit testing. <laughs> 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 not total. Now you would get some points if that was a, qu a test question or something. You would get some <laughs> some points. It's when you test more than one class together, so two or more. Right. <laughs> hey, he had he had the courage to answer the question. Uh, anyway, so this is we're testing CSV to XML, and we're also testing two other classes. One's called publication and one called one's called author. Right, so let's have a look at what this program does and, and what it looks like. I'm using, by the way, I'm using 
net beans if anybody else is using net beans. Anybody else here use net beans? No. What do you use? Eclipse? Eclipse. Eclipse. Okay. I tried Eclipse but I, I didn't I didn't get didn't get the good feelings from it right away. So I instantiate a new CSV to XML object, right? And then I open the input file. By the way, what what is this the pre-processing step before I open the input file? Is there a pre-processing step? Does anybody remember that from last time? Check if the file exists. That's a good that's a good thing to always check and see if the file exists. But there's something <coughs> even before that. Um have to convert it to an open source file. That's right, that's right. So we save it in CSV format, not Excel format. Right, so we take the Excel file, we, we save it in CSV format, comma separated values, which is a, a text file, right? Because Excel is closed and text, text format is open. So actually we're reading and now we've changed the, the problem we're reading now a CSV file instead of an Excel file and then we're converting that to XML so it's sort of a two conversion process <coughs> actually right so the first method is called open input file so that's pretty exciting isn't it <clears throat> this opens the input CSV file and I still I still had there's still some notes in here from back in the time when I started to write the program and I didn't have my library that I imported. I didn't import this, this nice library at first called OpenCSV-2.3 jar. So there are still some leftover notes and, and at the time, before I imported that library, I was actually looking up ways to remove white space in case you get white space. Right? If you, somebody t gives you a file name and it has white space either before the name or after the name, you have to remove it. Right? So I was looking up things like that. And that's what that note is. The white space characters. Right, and I made a I made a link to where I was looking up the white space characters. So here, we just call an accessor method called set input file. So not very. This is the old, the old things that I was trying to remove the white space before I started using the open CSV. So that is set input file. Does anybody know what set input? What what's that? That's an example of what kind of method that is. This is a very good question for a software engineering module. So that's a kind of method. It belongs to a special class of methods that are really important. Does anybody know what that class or kind of method is? Access our method. What's your name? Steven. Steven. Excellent, Steven. Excellent. That's so good that you know that. That's something that everybody needs to know. So you'll notice in this program we're always using access our methods. Always set get methods, right? To set local variables, member variables, right? We're always using those. And in each of the methods, there's this little test flag that I can t set to true if I'm debugging or trying to test the program to see if it's actually working. Right? And then I try to create a new CSV reader object based on the input file. And if, it, if, it, if there's no file, right, it throws an exception. Otherwise, it returns true, right, and, and it succeeds in opening the CSV file, right, so not, that's not very exciting, right. So let's go back to the main method.
that's the program, by the way. It's very elegant, right? Open input file, read publications, close input file, right? Open output file, write to XML, and then close the output files. So the, the only complicated method is read publications. It's, well, I don't know if you want to call it complicated. The only non-trivial method is called read publications. So let's, let's look at it. So this reads basically, right, we have a table and it goes through the table one row at a time and reads in the data. I imagine you, this might be part of your assignment in this class too, right, to read in some data from a file. Is that part of the assignment? Is it in CSV format, the data? What, which format is it in? I have to define my own. You have to define your own. Okay, so you could define the CSV yeah, format as your own. It's easier to just add some comma, commas maybe when you say. Yeah, that's what this is. Yeah, it's commas just, maybe. Yeah, yeah. That's it. So you could actually use this for your assignment, right? You could see how, it, how to get it to work. Right? This is very, very common processing file input and output processing so it's it's that's another reason why it's so such an interesting example so the local testing flag the way the CSV reader works is that it reads in one line at a time from the CSV file so it just reads in one line and it stores it in an array of strings so that's what a string array looks like. That means each entry in the array is a string. That's what that means. And then, that's fun. This is one of the fun things about Java. It has an integer object, which is kind of, if you're a second year student, that's kind of funky. For me, I think it's great. Like, but for a second year student, it might be like, an integer object, because you're used to integer data types, are you? Like int 1 or, or whatever, x. That's an integer object, and I, I use that to convert a string to a number. Like if we, if we read in a 1 from a text file, it's a character, it's a string. And we use the integer object to convert that string or a character to an integer data type, right? An ASCII character of one to an integer data type of one, for example. And we'll see that in action. This is just some debugging things. I always like to put in some debugging. This really should have like an if test equals true then output this information. And I, I recommend this for everybody for the rest of their life. This is a convention that I use always in all of my software. And I, I think it's a great, great convention. So if I'm printing out anything, the printout statement always starts with the name of the class doing the printing and then the name of the method that the printing is called from. Right, so I know if the program were to crash, of course it's not going to crash, but if it were to crash, I would know exactly where, right? which class, and which method. I was really surprised to find out that students didn't use this already back, back in the day when I was teaching this. I have a method called skip line, so it starts with skip line. Anybody know what this is for? Skip new line characters. Any other guesses? Where's the attendance register? Hiding. Everybody sign it. Any other guesses about the skip line? Why that's there? It's because 
because the first line of the Excel file is just that it's not really data. Remember? It says it says the word abstract keywords paper ID. It's the column headers. So that's not data that I want to read and in store as a record. I'm not converting that first line. So I have a method called skip line. And then we try to read in the data, read the CSV records from the file using a scanner object. So this is a complicated line. I, I don't usually like to write complicated lines like this. But anyways, it's, it's, a, it's a, essentially a loop that processes each line one at a time until we get to the end of the file. Right? So there's get read one line that's called read next line. Store it in the as a as a as an in the string array. There it is, next line, right? And only do that if you have something being returned by read next, right? It's going to stop if read next returns null and read read next returns null if it's at the end of the file or if the file is empty by or something like that it just has nothing in it so now the 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 row is stored in this next line string array so we have to get the information out of the string array and then store it somewhere right. so we instantiate a new publication right because each line in the Excel file corresponds to one publication. Right? So for each line, we instantiate a publication object. Right? And the publication object stores all the information about one publication. Right? An ID, a title, abstract keyword, start page, and page range. So here's the string here's this the the string array. So in the pub in the new publication object, the first thing is the ID, right? And that's the string array, and that's the entry in the string array that contains the ID. Right? That's very easy to understand, isn't it? So the ID comes first. We can verify that by looking at the Excel file if we want. The next thing that comes is the paper title. So I have set the paper title. So these are all accessor methods again. Set the abstract. Set the keywords. And then the next thing after keywords is the starting page. So if all of these publications appear in a book, they all have a start page, and the first one is 529. So this reads in the start page as a string, and then it uses the integer object, the built-in integer object in Java, to convert it, well, it, it to convert it, well, it stores it as, as an integer object first, and then it converts it to an actual integer data type. That's what those two lines do. Does that make sense to everybody, I hope? We're converting a string to an integer object, a string data type to an integer object there. And then we set the page range does anybody notice anything kind of interesting about these these lines? Something that, that you don't usually see that makes the world a much better place? Formatting. The formatting is, is aligned. It's unusual. So the formatting highlights the redundancy. But the way we're accessing the array is kind of unusual, isn't it? Most beginner level programmers, average novice newbies, 
we just put in a zero here, a one here, a two here, a three here, and a four here, and then a five here, rather than symbolic constants. Right? That's what most newbies average, kind of not not very expert expert developers would do, right? They would just put the numbers in there. Isn't it true? Any problems with that? It makes it much more difficult to read. You don't know what the numbers are. Anybody know what they're called? When you, you just said it. I think you just said it. Magic numbers. How did you know that? Well done. Neil Harmon said that? Awesome. Way to go, Neil. I need to pat him on the back. Yes, those are called magic numbers. Anytime you see a number in there, it's a magic number because you don't know what it is. Imagine you, you see two sixes, like you see a six here and a six in a different method. Are they both the same six? We don't know. One could be like a six pack of beer and one could be a six, six muffins. If we want to change the six muffins that doesn't, maybe we want to change the six pack of beer, we just don't know, right? It's a, they're, they're, it's a total mystery. So we get rid of the magic numbers. Another advantage of this is if any of these columns changes, right, maybe the format changes, I can just simply change the, the, the number here and I can change my columns accordingly very easily. So if the columns change their positions, it's easy to, to change the, the code. Right, so that's the read, that's the start of the read publications. And then the next bit is read authors. Now, read authors is in its own method because it's a little bit kind of, well, it's not really tricky, but it, it would make this method too long if, if it was stuck inside here. And the other sort of non-trivial aspect about the authors is we don't know how many there are in advance. There could be one author, there could be two or three, or I mean there could be a hundred. It's not very common, but some publications have a hundred, 150 authors. It's not very common, but we don't know in advance how many authors there are going to be. So we take that out And we look at the read authors method. Right, so read authors, it, it has a reference to the next line and it has the current publication that we're adding the authors to. Right? And it's been doc it's been Java docked, so it's it's pretty clear. The current record from the CSV file and the current publication the authors wrote. We have our local testing flag. We have the integer object again. We don't know how many authors there are. So the first thing we do is we compute the number of authors. This is a little bit difficult to follow. It's, it's possible to follow with, with symbolic constants. But without these symbolic constants here, you would not be able to follow this. Right? So we're taking the length of the, the whole row and we're subtracting off the page range from that whole length. So imagine the whole length, right? That's the beginning and that's the, the end. We're subtracting off the bit in the beginning up to the page, up to the page range. So we're subtracting off this bit getting all the fields up to the page. And then the rest of the information is authors. But there are three columns for each author. The surname, the first name, and the affiliation. So we divide by three. Take the whole length, subtract off the beginning, divide the remainder by three. And we get the number of authors. So that's, that's what this line is doing. Entries per author. 
which is 3 in this case. So if we're testing, then we compute the number of authors, and then we read in an author list, right? For each author, create a new author object where we store the author information, and that's what this is. So here's an author. It has a first name, last name, and affiliation. Right. We set the first name. And this is a kind of funky way of finding out where the first name is in the, in the array. Right. That's, that's being computed each time. <clears throat> so it's, it's the authors plus the first name and then the entries times i for the first author so i is zero in the in the in the first instance right so the first author is just the author index plus the first name the author's index plus the last name and then the author's index plus the affiliation and when in the next loop i is one right so to get the next three, we have to multiply that one by three to jump to the next three in the for loop. That's what that multiplication is, i times entries per author. And if, again, if I was using magic numbers in there, you'd have no chance of, of knowing what was going on there. If I just had like numbers like five, three, and two in there, and then 5, 3, and 3, and then 5, 3, and 4. You just have no idea what was going on there. Well, you'd have some idea because of the names, set first name, set last name, and set affiliation. But you wouldn't really understand how they were being computed. And if we have an empty author, if for some reason there's an empty author, we skip it. <clears throat> right and then we add the authors to the publication right? so that's the idea for read authors and then we're going to read publications right so we have our loop we have our, for each publication, then we have our read authors, and then we get the list of publications, so we started a list of publications and we add it to the list. So there is a list of publication objects, and we're just adding it to the list. So get publications, there's a, there's a list down there, right there, a list of publications and we're just adding it to the list. Any questions about that? So you can use something like this in your project. Uh, let me see if there's anything else in there. And then there are lots of exceptions, right? If something goes, if there's an I.O. exception, right? Some we get interrupted in the middle of reading. An element, no such element exception, and format exception. Right? And let's see what else we have. <clears throat> we close our input file, right? I even have a method a comment, don't forget to close your input file. Then we open an output file, which is the XML file, and we write to XML. There are two versions. One is write all of the, all of the information to one XML file, and then another one is take each entry and put it in its own XML file. There are two. Right. And if we go back here, this is, this is all of them together, and this is the individual 
months. And the file name we're using is the paper ID in this case. So write to XML, what does that look like? So I'll put the list of publications in XML format to a single file. Later on, there was a change request to write each publication in its own XML file. So we added a method to do that. And we left, I left this one just in case the client changed their mind again and said, oh no, actually I changed my mind again. I want to go back to the, to the single file. And so we have our testing flag. We open the output file. And I did buy a book on XML just to make sure that I was following the, the, the standard XML formats, all of the standards. So all XML files have this as their first line. It's a standard file format. Right. Then I output, start outputting each of the publications, right? So the publications start with this tag called publication list, right? Has anybody seen XML before? Yeah, it's very similar to HTML. And we have a for loop for each publication in the list, get the publication and then write it to the XML file. Right, so there's a publication object, and it has a method called write to XML. <coughs> and that's what it looks like when you write a single publication to XML format. Right. So it has a begin publication tag, the end publication and then the paper ID, the title, the abstract, the keywords, the year, the type, and so on. And then there's another for loop for each author in the author's list, print out the author. So that's in its own method too, called, guess what, write to XML. And that's what it looks like when you output a single author to the same XML file, right? You have a begin author tag, the first name, the surname, the affiliation, and the last, well, the, the, the end author tag, right? And then we return true. So author is pretty simple. So output each publication end the list, catch the exceptions, and then return true. So very, very, very simple output, very easy. And the, the unique one is very, very similar, right? So write to unique file, output the publications, where each publication is stored in its own file, so here, we cycle through the publications again, and then we call a method called write to unique XML file in the publications class, in the publication class, right? So we output this in its own file, right? Here we're opening the file and closing the file. Each time. Right, so we're opening a new file and closing the file every time. And then author, right, there's a for loop for author. And actually, this one is the same. So we actually didn't have to write any new method for the author, because it's exactly the same method. 
which is very convenient, isn't it? That's, that's a good example of code reuse. Now that's the integration testing. That, that's basically, those are the most interesting methods from, from the CSV to XML example. So you can get a copy of this on Blackboard, right, or on my webpage. <coughs> and to wrap things up, which this was, a, again, this was an example of integration testing. Well, what about the unit testing bits? Well, if we look at the publication class, it has surprise, surprise, a main method. So this is the method we can use for testing, unit testing, the publication object or class. It's an example of unit testing. Adding authors is also a good example of integration testing for the publication plus author combination. Right. So if you imagine you're working on a project and each of you is responsible for an object or a class to write it and you have to demonstrate to your other team members that it's working, this is the way to go. This is how you demonstrate. So you, can't, you don't have arguments about if it's working or not, like, class, like, does your class really work? You don't have to argue about that anymore because you have a unit test with your class that calls each method in the class with invalid and valid input. Right? So begin the unit test. We create a new publication and then we just start adding artificial data to the publication. That's all artificial data. We test the author class we add artificial data to the author class or an author object. We print the publication to make sure the printing is working. We write it to an XML file right, to make sure that that's working. And we, we open the output file, write to a unique XML file, close the output file, and so on. So that's an example of a, a very trivial unit test right there. But I, maybe I can convince you that publication, the object, is working. Or maybe not. If we were working in a team, would you trust me? Could I do any better than this unit test? Any guesses? Say it again. JUnit. Yeah, you could use JUnit. What would you do with JUnit if you use JUnit? How how could you improve this? Any other things we could do to improve this? Maybe maybe we don't like the complexity of J units. Maybe we do. It's good to know about. Any other ideas on how this could be improved? Liam, Liam Chalice in my tutorial group. Liam, what do you think? Any ideas on how to improve this unit test? Quite hear you. Yes, that is correct. You could test with more input data, right? Some artificial, some artificial Excel file data. Very good answer. Very good answer. 
Any other thoughts how to improve this? So I, I didn't do, the, the truth is I didn't do a very good job with the unit testing here. It's like the most minimal possible unit testing in the world. It's not that great. Any other suggestions how I could improve that? Hey, Alistair? Yeah. What do you think? Uh, I'd say more uh, method calls, different calls that. More what calls? More method calls. More method calls, yep. With, with what? Uh, Uh, different data? Yeah. Okay. Any special kind of data? Uh, incorrect data, I guess. Incorrect, yes! That's exactly right. So you, you bombard your methods with invalid input, too, to make sure they don't crash and they can handle it. They should just throw an error that says invalid inputs. So yeah, the more you can do that, the better, right? So that's where it starts to get complicated, trying to test all the invalid cases. That starts to get very complicated. And then it starts to make sense to think about more complex ways to test the methods, like using maybe JUnit to give the, these methods lots of invalid input and see if they don't crash. Okay, any questions about that? So you can get a copy of this on Blackboard. If, if there's some reason it's not there, just let us know, but it should already be there along with the other classes. You can use this as in, the, in your programs, right, to import, to read in CSV files and all that stuff. Any questions about that? Comments? Anybody find it interesting? <laughs> to see an actual program that does something. I'm surprised nobody said, oh, Bob, you didn't run the program, actually. I don't know. I don't think it actually works. So maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Let's try it out. See if it actually works. <laughs> it's a very fast laptop, as you can see. On a normal laptop, it would be, it would be you know, instantaneous. So it, it sort of looks like it worked, right? There's some console, there's a lot of debugging information there because I like, you know, because, you know, it's sort of work in progress, right? And then we can check the actual files, right? That's the XML file, or well, one of the XML files. And I actually don't know what's, what Safari does with an XML file. Let's see what the suspense is agonizing. I, I don't know what, what Safari does with an XML file. <sighs> like I said, I tried to have a really, really fast laptop. <laughs> it looks like it's okay. I don't know. I don't know why that is. Don't know why. But we can try opening it with something else. For example, text edit so that didn't crash so that's that's what it looks like the XML file so you got your publication list and then a publication and then your abstracts and so on So it seems to work, but you can download it and test it for yourself to see if it actually works. Any questions or comments? Okay, we'll stop by now.
Tuesday.